right, welcome to Family Worship Sunday at Maranatha. How y'all doing today? La la la. This is us playing pretty music. Y'all, let's go ahead and stand together. Have we got any venture kids in the house? Why are they so quiet when I ask that? Have we got any venture kids in the house? There we go, a couple of them hooting and hollering. Well, we're going to have a great time today. We're going to start with a song you all know. But first off, we're going to start with prayer. So, Lord, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your goodness and promising to gather with us when we gather in your name. And God, as we, as we embark onto this moment, we ask that you would receive all the glory for everything that happens in here today. Uh, that your name would be lifted up, that you would draw men to you, and that you would teach us to love you better and to follow your word more closely. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Now, let's get ready to put those hands together, church. Come on, we didn't forget how to clap, did we? Yeah, come on now. Oh, we're going to have a little fun this morning. Rising, rising, the river is rising, 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 rising,
is out Watch the waters part before him now Come and see what he has done for us Tell the world of his great love Our God is the God who saves Our God is the God who saves Let God arise Let God arise Our God reigns now and forever He reigns now and forever Let God arise Let God arise Oh, sing our God reigns Our God reigns now and forever He reigns now and forever Oh, our confidence is in you today, Lord Come on And his enemies will run for sure Church will stand, she will endure. Cause he holds the keys of life, our Lord. Death has no sting, no final word. Our God is the God who saves. Oh, yes, our God is the God who saves. among many gods who saves. Our God is the only God who is the Savior of men. If you're saved today, it's through Jesus Christ alone. Come on now. Our God is the God who saves. He is the God who saves. Our God is the God who saves. Oh, yes, He is. Our God is the God who saves.
Welcome and thank you guys for being with us today. I'm Pastor Susie, the kids pastor here, and uh, I'm excited to be here to worship with you guys this morning on our Family Worship Sunday. Uh, that's why all our kids are in here. Uh, on our Family Worship Sunday, I know you guys all like to sit together, but the whole point is to be with your family. So after worship, will you please go sit with your family? Love you guys. <laughs> okay, so it's our job to lead by example for our kids. So again, thank you guys for putting in the effort of being here today and for bringing your kids along with you. If you're a visitor this morning, welcome. We're so excited to have you with us. There should be a visitor card in front of you uh, on the back side of the pew. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, we would love to connect with you. There's also a QR code on the screen if you'd rather not deal with paper. Um, you can either submit it uh, through the QR code or if you do wanna fill it out on paper, you can turn it in. When you pick up offering in a few minutes, just drop it in the offering uh, bag or you can turn it into the welcome desk out front on your way out. Also, uh, the new soaking verse is in the bulletin. So if you didn't grab one, make sure you get one. Okay, all my venture kids, if you guys will come up front, the girls right here have your notes for you to help you uh, follow along with the sermon today. Remember, if you guys fill those out and turn them in on Wednesday, you can earn a fun reward or a treat. transition to the next part of our worship, which is our Kingdom Builders offering. So ushers, if you'll please come. So giving is so important and it's our job to model and be the example for our kids. Our giving isn't or shouldn't feel like it's just a chore we do weekly or monthly. Uh, it's an act of honoring God. So let's pray and honor God together this morning. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. We love you. Thank you for all these smiling faces out here, the young, the old, the in-between, all of us, Lord. We are here today together to worship you and to honor you, Lord. I pray that you will bless each and every person here, God. We pray, pray that you will bless the offering and use it how you see fit, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to Maranatha Family Church. Tomorrow, the first of our community groups will kick off. It is a group for blended families. If you want to jump in, there's still time. Sign up on the app today and see Pastor Jeremy for details. We will have our annual business meeting this Tuesday at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary if you'd like to attend. On Saturday, February 17th, we hope you will join us for our Daddy-Daughter Valentine's Dance. This will be a great time full of food, dancing, and fun. Online registration is open now, or just scan the QR code on the screen and register today. If you would be willing to help out in any way, see Pastor Jeremy or Kelly Stone. Ladies, make plans to be here at 6.30 on February 13th for our Galentine's dinner. Don't forget to invite a friend. The Legacy Men's Conference will be held March 15th and 16th in Warner Robins. Sign up in the foyer today and get ready for a great time with some great guys. Go ahead and mark your calendars for a very important day here at Maranatha. On February 25th, we will have a special service called Catch the Vision. We're going to look at what we want to accomplish for the Kingdom of God in 2024 and present the roadmap for how we plan to do it. We want everyone who calls Maranatha home to be here that day. So come early and get a great seat. Thanks again for worshiping with us today. All right, church, let's go ahead and stand up together one more time. We've come to offer praise to the God of all victory, the God who's won every victory that we've ever enjoyed. You're talking to a man who has spent a lot of time on battlefields that have been victorious, but not one of them has been because of me. Every battle I've ever won has been pre-won for me by the goodness of my Savior. And I know if you are in Christ today, you have the same testimony. Let's have that in mind as we sing. Let's, let's not let this just be words on the screen. This is a testimony song. 
Let's sing it together. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe in. Speak it in faith. Because God has served knows only how to triumph.
just praise him this morning. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. song it speaks of the victories that God has already won on our behalf but the one it's speaking of in the central part of the song is the one I'm in the middle of right now this is not just look what the Lord has done this song is look what the Lord will do I have the promise of his word that if I am in the vine I will be victorious I have nothing to fear because failure is not an option because I'm not the one fighting the battle, the battle yesterday has already been won and I give God the glory for it. And today, from the middle of the battlefield, with the bullets flying, I give God the glory for the victory that I'll be celebrating tomorrow. That, that's the Christian walk. That's the faith that we get to walk in. If that does not generate gratitude in our hearts, then we've missed something. Ours is not just a struggle until we can finally limp into heaven. Ours is a victorious walk that will take us from glory to glory until we sit at his feet and give him honor face to face for what he's brought us through and the blessing he's brought us to. That should give us gratitude. That, that, should, that should make us love him more than, he ever, than we ever have before. Because it's not just what was, it's what will be. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Produce gratitude in our hearts today. All my words fall short.
give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. I like when that lion gets out. Hey, we're so glad to have you today. Isn't that a great job of praise and worship? Amen. We're going to be looking at the uh, book of 1 Kings, mainly chapter 19, but I want to talk a little bit about other things. Have you ever had, maybe since we have children in here, your mom or your dad ever asked you the question, what are you doing here? Maybe you had a maybe you had a boss when you showed up on the job and he said, Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's kind of different, isn't it? What are you doing here? What if I ask you that question this morning? What are you doing here? Don't answer me. What are you doing here? In the chapter 19 of First Kings, it's unique. In verse 9. It says, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said, talking to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's funny that almost just three or four verses later, chapter, uh, verse 13, he says, and when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave and behold, there came a voice that said unto him, What are you doing here, Elijah? That's twice. Now, whenever God does something twice, it always kind of catches my attention, makes me wonder, what's he doing? So I go all the way back to really verse uh, chapter 17. I want to read the back story. I want to see what's happening. And so Elijah is we don't know it at this time, but he's sort of nearing, sort of nearing the end of his ministry, if you will. And uh, he comes on the scene. All of a sudden, Elijah prays, and it doesn't rain. He said, I'm going to pray, and it's not going to rain for like two and a half years. And so Israel and, and all of that region gets in bad shape. In fact, it happens to the man of God as well. Let me tell you, the Bible tells you it rains on the just and the unjust. So he suffers as well as far as the brooks have dried up, the things are happening. So God sends him down to a brook area while there's still water there, and he sends the ravens in. You say, why is that important? You'll see. Sends the ravens in, the raven feeds him, and he eats there night and day, night and day. The brook dries up. So then he goes to a widow woman's house, and there she feeds him. She feeds him noon and day and night and day, and, and just things happen. One, on one of his uh, consequent days there, something happens, tragic. The woman's son dies. Elijah comes, and she said, why have you blessed me, or why have I been blessed, and now God's taken away my child? You ever felt like that? Everything going right, you, you think everything's good and things just sort of fall out the bottom does. That's kind of the way she felt. And so Elijah takes this young man up to his loft where he stays, lays him on his bed, lays down on him and gets up, lays down on him, gets up, lays down on him, gets up, and God heals, brings back to life that young man. What a miracle. He goes from there And God tells him, go show yourself to Ahab. Ahab is king of Israel at this time. His wife is that wonderful woman we know by the name of Jezebel. Some names just grate you. Jezebel's one of them. And so he says, go show yourself to Ahab. And about that same time, Ahab goes to Obadiah, who is kind of over the palace, if you will, And so he says to Obadiah, we're going to go look for water because we got to try to help save some of our animals. And he said, you're going to go one way and I'm going to go another and we're going to go and find water. And so they set out to do so. On Obadiah's trek, he runs into Elijah. 
And Elijah talks to him in a minute, and he said, Obadiah, go back and show yourself to Ahab and tell him that you know where Elijah is. And Obadiah's like, <laughs> not me. I mean, if I go back and I tell Ahab that I found Elijah, about the time that I do, the Spirit of the Lord's going to move on you and psh, you're going to be gone. And then Elijah, Ahab's going to say to me, where is he? And I'm going to say, I don't know. And I'm going to get killed and I don't want any part of that. I, I guess I could agree. I could agree with him. And Elijah said, no, you go back and tell him, you know where Elijah is. And so he does. And so Abra uh, at that point, Elijah calls together all of the people. He gets to Ahab and he said, look, how long are you going to dance between two opinions? If God be God, let him be God. We got to make a decision here. And so he, he says to Ahab, call all the children of Israel down, call the prophets in, bring them all in under Mount Carmel, and there we're going we're gonna to see whose God is God. I wonder sometimes we ought to make an ultimatum to our world about that, serve who our God is God. So as they gather there, and I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason, they gather there, and so... Uh, uh, Elijah says, you guys go first. You call on your God. You, we're going to make a, 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 get our animal sacrifice. We're going to lay it out here on the altar. And the God who answers, we're not going to put any fire under it. And so the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And so he says, you guys go ahead. And so they get the sacrifice. They put it on the altar and they begin to call out. A word says they called out from like nine in the morning till noon. They're just crying out, God, come, God, come. Nothing happens. So is uh, Elijah being the fine young prophet that he is, starts taunting them. Maybe your God is uh, asleep. Maybe he took a vacation. Maybe he just can't hear you. You need to cry a little louder. And so they begin to scream and cry. Even the scripture said they begin to cut themselves with lances and spears and bleed on the altar, just pleading for their God to come and answer by fire. This went on then all the way into the evening, it said to the oblation. And so nothing happened. No answer, no fire, no nothing. So Elijah takes... And he rebuilds the altar of God, and he puts the sacrifice on it, but he just doesn't stop there. He goes and has them to dig around the altar, a ditch, if you will, and, and fills it with water. Not once, not twice, three, four times, I think it is. He fills this thing with water, pours it over the sacrifice in order to show them the power of God. And so in just a little bit, I don't know about the new versions, but in the King James Version, it's like a 63-word prayer. He calls on God. You know who you are. We want to show them who you are. And all of a sudden, the fire of God comes out of heaven and consumes the sacrifice. Not only does it consume the sacrifice, but Scripture tells us in one place that it licked up the water, just licked it up, just burn it and, and, and dissolved it. Elijah well, said, let the one that answers by fire be God. And so he took the prophets down and killed them all, the prophets of Baal. And he said to uh, Ahab, just so you, it, almost like an exclamation point, just so you know who the real God is, it's going to rain today. So you better take off. You better get back. Now he goes to Jezreel, and it's funny to me that, that Elijah follows him there. I don't know why. Can't figure it out. He goes back. Maybe he wants to see what's going to happen in Israel. I don't know. But as soon as Ahab gets back, man, he runs to Jezebel, who wears the pants in that family, I can tell you, and says to her, this Elijah dude has just 
wiped out all the prophets of Baal. He's consumed the sacrifice the fire of God has. He's causing it to, uh, about to rain. He's been a bad boy. And Jezebel says, you know what? My name ain't Jezebel. I'm going to kill him before the day's out. Before it reaches tomorrow, he's going to be like one of the prophets of Baal. I'm going to kill him. And Elijah, who has seen the rain stop, who has seen the ravens feed him, who has seen the widow's son healed and raised from the dead, who has seen God send a fire down and lick up the socket of the water and burn and consume the fire, all of a sudden it says he was afraid. I think it's verse 3. It said in 19, he was afraid. I'm going, what is wrong with this picture? The man of God who has seen miracle after miracle, powerful things happen, all of a sudden, he's afraid. And he takes off, lickety split, running, getting out of there. Boy, he don't want anything to do with Jezebel. So he runs and runs and runs until he's exhausted and he winds up under a, one, one, one version says a broom tree, one says a juniper tree, a big shade tree. There he is wore out. I think at this point, somehow or another, Elijah's depressed. He goes to sleep. The angel of the Lord wakes him up, feeds him. Got bread cooked on hot coal, hot stones. Gives him water to drink. He goes back to sleep. He wakes him up a second time, feeds him again. I heard a, a psychologist one day uh, talking about this verse, and he said, that's what happens when we get depressed. We need to eat and we need to rest. So it appears that, that God is causing him to, to rest and recuperate because he's still got another challenge laid out before him. He finally gets him up and Elijah runs to a cave. What's interesting is when he gets to the cave, he's just kind of down and out. Verse 19 he came to the cave, and he lodged, verse 9, I should say. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, what's unique is verse uh, 3. He was afraid, and he rose and ran for his life, came to Beersheba. Then when he comes to him and says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He comes up with, with this thing. He, he begins to say, hey, I, I'm here because I'm the only one left. I'm, I'm here because I've, I've tried to be faithful to the Lord, but I'm the only one left. You see what happens is now that he's afraid, now that he's run for his life, now that he's been in this kind of pity party, he wants to offer excuses. I'm here all by myself. Nobody cares. Woe is me. So it's interesting to me that in verse 9, God asked him that question. And then again in verse 13, he asked him the same question. Elijah, what are you doing here? Now that intrigued me. Both times Elijah gives him the same answer. Both times he says to him, well, I'm all by myself. Nobody cares. I'm just doing everything. Did you know when people get to the point that they're out of sorts, they're afraid, they're maybe depressed, they always offer that same excuse. I'm here by myself. Nobody cares. I'm all by myself. Nobody wants to do it. I'll just do it all myself. I don't know why we do that. But that's exactly what Elijah does. I'm afraid. I don't know what else to do. What are you doing here? I want you to think about that for a second. Here he's had all of these glorious experiences. He's had all and seen all of these powerful miracles. I mean, this is just not a, not a, a, a happenstance. This thing over and over from chapter 17 all the way to chapter 19, he sees the manifest power of God. He watches God as he does his most tremendous work. 
And then all of a sudden, when he says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He comes up with that, that business. Well, I'm all by myself. Nobody cares. Woe is me. Kind of pity party. And twice God's asked him. That caught my attention because there's got to be something there. The English language is a funny language. I, I try to speak to Yuli's brothers and mom sometime. They're Spanish. They don't know very much English. And uh, if, if you talk to them, they don't answer you back because <laughs> they probably don't know what you're saying. And so I know, a few, I know a few Spanish words, so I'll ask them how they're doing, and they'll tell me they're doing good, and then they'll ask me in English, how are you doing? But it's, uh, the English language is difficult to learn because the same word can have different meanings depending on how it's used. Even the word here. Elijah, what are you doing here? I was so interested in that word that I went into the dictionary, old-fashioned dictionary, and looked up the word here because I'm, I'm thinking God's got, a, God's got something here. He's, he's talking to Elijah, and he's asking him the same question twice. It's funny, the second time comes after he sends him to the mouth of the cave and the, and the winds come and tears the mountains apart and the earthquake comes and all of that. And then there's a still small voice that speaks. And it doesn't seem to really shake Elijah. And he asks him a second time, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, if you look at the word here, H-E-R-E, -E, there's something we need to see here. First of all, he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Here, meaning this point and juncture, this point in your life, this juncture in your life, what are you doing here? And so, uh, of all the people in the world, Elijah He's saying to him, what are you doing here? What are you doing at this point in juncture? Has it been that long since I sent ravens to feed you and take care of you? Or I, I told you to go face Ahab face to face, and he came with 50 hand-picked men, and you looked him square in the eye, and you were not afraid. What's going on here, Elijah? All of a sudden, Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you before the day's out. I'm going to do to you what you've done to them. I'm going to take care of you. And so he comes running to this place, and he's in this cave, and God says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? What, what's happening in this place? What is the point that you've gotten to? Of all the people with great experiences behind you, you have been so fearless. What are you doing here? At this juncture of your life, are you hiding? At this juncture of your life, at this point in your life, have you decided it's not worth it? And I wonder sometimes if God ought not to say to us, what are you doing here? What are you doing at this point in your life? Well, I'm just taking a sabbatical. I'm just sort of chilling out. You know, I'm really old now, and I can't do much. Just saying. I remember when I was going through a tough time, and, and uh, I was just like doing all kind of things. And I remember God said to me one day, David, what are you doing? And I had to be honest, and I said, I'm running from you. I'm running from you. I'm tired. I'm scared. My life is falling apart. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to get away from you. I'm going to tell you, it's hard to get away from God. Elijah found out that to be true. So God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
So at this point and this juncture of your life, the question may come to you, what are you doing here today? What are you doing here? Most of us look at God and go, I don't really know what I'm doing here, Lord. I don't really understand what my life is all about. I don't understand why all these miracles can take place and one Jezebel can say, I'm going to kill you before the day's through and you fall apart. In other words, he's saying to Elijah, Elijah, I'm greater. I'm, in, I'm, I'm greater than the fire. I'm greater than the earthquake. I'm greater than the wind. I'm greater than all of these other things. I'm greater than all of that. And at it, it, one voice of one lady, you turn tail and run. Elijah, what are you doing here? At this point and at this juncture in your life, what are you doing here? Now, if we take the emphasis and we put it on that word here again and ask that question, Elijah, and maybe, maybe that's the reason he asked it a second time. I never could figure out why he asked it twice. Surely Elijah heard him the first time. Why did he ask it again? Maybe he too was putting a different emphasis on the word here. The word here, what are you doing here, Elijah? Here meaning in this spot or in this locality. Not what are you doing generally, what's going on in your life. What are you doing right here? What are you doing in this place, in this spot? What purpose do you have for being here? You've run, you've hid You've cowered down. Every time I ask you what's going on, you're, I don't know, I'm, I'm all by myself. Nobody else cares. Everybody else is deserted. I'm here all by myself. I'm trying to do the best I can. What are you doing here? Maybe God would ask us today, what are you doing here today? Well, I'm supposed to go to church. It's Sunday. What are you doing here? Well, I'm kind of, I don't want the preacher to fuss at me or the wife send me text, so I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. But what are you doing here? What are you doing here today? Did you come to praise God? Did you come to sing? Did you come to get a word from the Lord? Did you come to get prepared to meet the world and all that's going on out there. What are you doing here? Have you ever been someplace that uh, you knew God didn't want you? I have. Maybe as a date, maybe as a job, maybe it was a child. As a child, you went to a place you were told not to go. One time when I was a little boy, my, I came in from uh, school and my mama said, your daddy said not go out and play today. Well, that just meant a challenge to me. Oh, I'm going out. There wasn't nothing much but woods around there, and so I took off being a, another little boy. I took out across the street and ran across an empty vacant lot, and there I fell, and a little pine sapling had broke off, and it was about that long. And I got up, and I was hurting, and my pants was tore just a little bit. A little boy was standing there with his mouth open. And I looked down and moved the pants back, and my leg, leg was just ripped open. When I say ripped open, it took 52 stitches to sew it up. It was cut to the bone. You could see the bone in there. Well, mind you, we didn't have a hospital in S Springfield at that point. You had a few doctors, but they were hard to get to. My mama, he ran over and told my mom and my brother, and they came over there, and I never will understand why they picked me up to tote me instead of backing the car out there. But anyway, put me in the back of a 1956 Buick, took off to Savannah. Policeman picked us up, took us all through the parks back then, right through the middle of them, going to the hospital. They got to the hospital. That doctor looked and told my mom, he said, one 16th, maybe 32nd of an inch. He'd have cut the main artery in his leg. He'd have bled to death. You'd have never got him here. 
My mom could have said, what are you doing here? Well, disobeying. Sometimes I think maybe that's what Elijah did. He was here at that spot trying to find a place it appeared to get away from God. I've done that. It's a scary place to be. What are you doing here? What are you doing at this place? Have you ever been somewhere and wondered what you're doing there? Why did I come here? What's the purpose of me being here? What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing at this spot? I, I'm sure, almost sure, that Elijah felt some sense of humiliation when God asked him that question, and he knew he had really no business running and hiding in the wilderness. He served a God that was greater than anything that would come his way. So here's a question for us this morning. What are you doing here? What is God's plan for your life? Have you taken the time to sit down and say to God, what am I doing here? Why have you got me here? Why am I at Maranatha Family Church? Why am I in the army of God? Why am I here in the family of God? Are you running in the opposite direction from God? Are you pursuing God? A different calling than what he's placed on your life? It seems like God is saying, hey, Elijah, I didn't send you here. I didn't bring you here. What are you pursuing? Why are you not going and doing whatever I've asked you to do? Um, I'm all by myself, God. Nobody cares. All of the others are dead. And No, Elijah, that's not it. I read a story the other day. It was about Garth Brooks. He was, uh, Garth Brooks was a great country singer, as most of you know. What was interesting in this article is that I realized in this article he had sold more records than Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, even Elvis, which surprised me, any other solo artist in history. In fact, he'd done that in 12 years, in, in a 12-year span of his life, that's what happened. And several years ago, he finally announced, I'm quitting. I'm, I'm retiring. I'm going aside. And here's what he said about his decision to quit. Music is a gift from God. It comes naturally, he said. It's easy and I love it, but I'm finding now that it's not the most important thing in my life. When I look in the mirror, I see a guy full of flaws. I see the promises that he made that he hasn't kept. And I know that it's time to keep them. What I wanted when I started was to communicate to the world, and music was how I tried to do it. I can't read or write music, which uh, surprised me, but it's what I knew. And when people respond to your music, you got to look in the mirror and ask, is this what God put me here to do? It's evident through that article that Garth Brooks might have looked in the mirror one day and, and asked God, why did you put me here to do? And God might have answered back, well, until today, it was music. But today, I want you to do something else. I want you to start being a father to your children. There are promises that you have made and haven't kept and now it's time to keep them. Maybe Elijah is at that point that he doesn't really know where he fits in anymore. He's seen all these miracles, and yet in just an instant's time, he's running from a woman who said, I'm going to kill you before the day's out. And maybe he's wondering, what's my purpose here? What's my real reason for being? And why did I run here to this spot? And God may be asking you, what are you doing here today? What's your purpose? Are you doing what I've called you to do? Are you running from it? What are you doing here? And then notice of me the third thing. He says to Elijah, what are you, put your emphasis on the word doing. What are you doing here? 
Because that's a real important question. Elijah, what are you doing here? What's the purpose of your life? Here indicates the here and now. What are you doing here and now? It speaks to the present of self and mind. Where you're at, where you at in your mind? Where are you at doing what you're doing right now? You see, I understand that because some years ago, I was pastoring a church and it was doing rather well. It, was, it was, had grown in just six months' time from, from 60 to about 200 in just six months' time. We have the bulletins where we saw the count. It was, it was magnificent. It was growing. But I got feeling uneasy. The church loved me. The people uh, apparently, they didn't necessarily love each other, but they loved me. <laughs> I had a, it was a two-section church, and this section didn't like that section, and that section didn't like that section. And I had to pastor them, but I did, and they did all right as long as I stayed there. But I got a feeling uneasy. Pastor Branson and I were doing a lot of revivals and even some camp meetings together. And I decided one day, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to go on the evangelistic field. Back then, the churches had revivals, and you could get them, and I started running revivals. I was going to church and church and church, and sometime after I'd spent about 30 or 40 days away from home, I'd been all up in Arkansas and back down, and I kind of wondered, what am I doing? In fact, I, I didn't find that joy or happiness I didn't like preaching to different churches every week. I didn't like that. I love people. I'm a people kind of person. I love talking to the same people, preaching to the same people. I love sharing with the same. I feel a connection with you guys. So I asked myself the question, what are you doing? Well, maybe God said, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know, God. I'm just sort of lost. I don't know where I'm at. Elijah, had he answered God and, and told God the truth, he would have had to say, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting around here feeling sorry for myself. I mean, that's the truth, right? I'm just sitting here I'm all by myself, nobody cares, blah, blah, blah. He could have just went on. I don't care. I'm just here by myself. Sweetie, don't do that. Just all by myself, feeling sorry for myself. I'm in a pity party, just having a time. You know what I've decided? Many people lose the joy of the Christian life by not doing anything. You want to find miserable people? Find somebody not doing anything. They're miserable. They want, in essence, they want to do something. Sometimes they don't know what. Sometimes they can't get started. I don't know what the problem is. But I wonder if, if, if Elijah here isn't realizing that his ministry's coming to a close because it is right after this that God sends him out to anoint uh, the king of Israel and the king of, of uh, somewhere. <laughs> Y'all read it. You'll figure it out. And also to call Elisha to be his successor. So you wonder if Elijah's not in that cave going, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares what's going on in my life. And he's not doing anything. And he's getting more depressed and more down by the moment, by the hour, by the minute. What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, to me, church, Christianity is action. Christianity, the, the kingdom of God, is, is a, a great movement. 
God is doing something. God is creating something. God is always, he's a, he's a God of movement. He's creating a world. He's moving in our lives. He's doing all of these things. And God wants us to respond to that. And the truth is, when we don't respond to it, we kind of start feeling a little bit sorry for ourselves. I used to. You ever hear that? I used to. I do a lot. I used to be this. I used to be that. Question is, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing, Elijah? There is nothing static about Christianity. It's a positive it's, it's going somewhere. It's doing something. And if you want to be happy in Christianity, do something. Do something. I've talked about Gerald, Geraldine Barnhill for years. She was an idol to me. This woman loved God with all of her hearts. Her daughter's here today. I just thought about that. And her grandson. She was a great woman. She loved God with all of her heart, quiet, meek, mild. But if you needed somebody to clean a church or keep a nursery, she was your girl. She never boasted about it. Never look at me and look what I do. Just that's what her hands found to do. And she did an amazing job. If I had a kid, I'd want her to be keeping the nursery. I mean, we got great nursery keepers now. But she was just, she'd mother every kid in that place. She found something to do, and it made her life meaningful to the kingdom of God. Some of you have done that. Others have done it too. Royal Rangers and missionettes and what other else you've done. But Christianity is action. It's something. And so, and so when God says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? It's like, I've got things for you to do. I've got places for you to go. I've got things I need for you to take care of. But you're here going, I'm all by myself. Nobody cares. I hope nobody loves me. You ever get that way? I read a story about a theater that had a fire some years ago. Something like 40 people died in that fire. There was a young couple stood up front. They were engaged. In fact, he'd give her a great big old diamond ring. And all of a sudden, from the rear of that, that theater, the word cried, fire, fire! And more people just started moving and scrambling and going and somehow or another this young man was almost the very first one or might have been the very first one outside as people gathered out of the uh, on the front of the theater he began to look for his girlfriend and he finally found her and he kind of come up to her and, and uh, took her by the arm and he said I'm so glad that you're all right she didn't say anything. A little bit, he took her by the arm, and they started to walk through the crowd, and she sort of pulled away. He noticed something was wrong. They made their way on down the street and finally came to where she lived. And as they stood in front of the gate that led up to her door, she looked him right in the eyes, and when she did, she slid that beautiful diamond that he had given her and handed it to him. What have I done? What did I do? To which she responded, nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know, I don't mean to tell us that works by any means saves us, but it tells God how we feel about him and his ministry. It's a wonder, no wonder that Scripture tells us whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your heart. 
I believe there is a satisfaction in doing the work of God. But pastor, I can't teach. Pastor, I can't do this. <laughs> I just told you about a great woman who served God by keeping children and cleaning a church. You can do something for God. And it's not that you're doing something, it's that you're, you're in the process of allowing God to fulfill your life. Doing something for God is healthy. Doing something for God is a powerful thing. These beautiful people up here every week playing, 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 practicing, getting better. And my, they're doing a good job. They're giving. They found their place. They're in that ministry. There are people teaching. There are people doing work. There are people doing all kinds of things. And the thing is, it fulfills their hearts. It makes them feel useful. Makes them feel happy. I wonder sometimes why I see people who are older and bitter, and they're just like, well, I don't like what's going on in the church today, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, you're old, and I am too. <laughs> God's doing a great thing. In fact, I sit on Monday with of staff members, and I'm in awe of what all God is doing in our church for people who want to be a part of it. So in the words of God to Elijah, what are you doing here? Complaining, serving, being a part. The question, I think, really touched Elijah in a different way because Elijah would have had to say, I'm doing nothing. I'm just running. I'm hiding. I'm feeling sorry for myself. There's a midriff of questions or answers he could have given. But the worst one was the same thing about that young boy. You did nothing. Absolutely nothing. I don't want to stand in front of God at the end of this run, whatever and wherever and whenever it comes, and him say to me, what, did you, what are you doing here? David, uh, I want to come here. What are you doing here? What did you do there? What was your purpose? What was your plan? What am I doing here? Just to be productive in him. So how you answer that question, what are you doing here? You have to do it truthfully because God knows your every heart, knows everything about you. Someone has said, we're here on earth to do good to others while others are here for, well, I don't know. I don't know what they're here for. Some years ago, many, many years ago, right after I became a Christian, I felt God had called me to preach. I read a scripture in Philemon. I'm not sure I even know how to pronounce Philemon. <laughs> and I read it, and I've never forgotten it. It's verses 10 and 11. If you know Philemon, you know it's just one chapter. It said, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. This is the part. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Paul said that of Onesimus. I'd like for God to say that about me. You might have been useless one day, but now you're useful to me. You're useful to the ministry. You're useful to the kingdom. 
It was funny this past week. I sat down on Monday and started to just read and look and trying to find a sermon. And I found this sermon. I found this idea. And I began to work on it and worked all that afternoon, late into the evening, worked on it, got it done. And I was like, boy, this is, this is a good sermon. I'm going to like preaching this one. And I went home and I come back the next day and I went, ooh, that's not the right message. <laughs> you just, as a preacher, you just know those things. You know when it's right and when it's not. And I just said, this is not the right message. So I sat down and began to write again and look and study and try to get together something. And I got together this message and didn't realize that it was a precursor to that message. When I got through with this one, I said, that's why God brought me that one. Next week, I'm preaching a message, unless God <laughs> changes my mind, on God's masterpieces. You are. Indeed, God's masterpieces. So he said to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your presence? What are you doing in your ministry? So my question to you is, what are you doing here? Are you running? Are you just occupying a spot? Are you just doing nothing? Hmm. Let the Holy Spirit speak on that one. What are you doing here, Elijah? Lord, help us today. Help us to figure out what we're doing. There are some people sitting in this place, they're running from you, running, running, running. There are people sitting in this place that are doing absolutely nothing. There are people who have come to a place in their life where they're not sure what they're doing. They're lost and undone, figuring out, where do I belong? Where do I belong? Lord, there are people that change churches like they do socks because they're searching, but they never seem to find and the question becomes imperative to them as well what are you doing here sometimes it's a location sometimes it's just an attitude sometimes it's a work what are you doing here Elijah so, Holy Spirit, speak to the hearts of those that are here today. Because I, I, can't, I can't tell them. But your Holy Spirit can speak to their hearts individually and say to them, so what are you doing here today? Are you looking for me? Are you busy in the ministry? Are you working for the kingdom? What are you doing here? Have you lost your way? Are you searching in the dark? Where am I? What do I need to do? Where do I need to be? Lord Jesus, help us to find that question and the answer to it. As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to tell you something. I've seen this scripture, read this scripture scores of times. It, it is funny to me that directly after God asked Elijah this question, that Elijah was told then, go name your successor. I wonder if God was saying you've lost your way, you hadn't figured it out, you don't know what you're doing. So Elijah, it's time for you to check out and it's time for you to put somebody in your place. Well, I don't want that to happen. I want to cry out to God, hey, use me. Whatever you want to do in my life, use me. Ever how long you want to use me, use me. Wherever you want me to be, I want to be there. I don't want to ever say it's too old, too long, too short, too whatever. I want to do it. 
ask yourself the question this morning, what are you doing here? And then put your name there. Put your name there. What are you doing? What are you doing? You may be here today and you don't know Christ. Maybe you like run away from him. You're here and you're lost and you're without him. God is speaking to you through the Holy Spirit and saying, what are you doing here? Why are you throwing your life away? Why are you running? Why don't you make good for this thing? Why don't you do something for me? If you're in this place today and you'd slip up that hand, you'd let me know I'm that person, Pastor. I'm, I'm sort of out of it. I need help. Would you pray for me? I won't embarrass you, but I will pray for you because I'm concerned. I thought this was a funny sermon when God first gave it to me. I'm like, why in the world? But there may be somebody here today and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now and he's simply saying, what are you doing here? What's going on? Why is your life a wreck? Why are you in such a mess? What are you doing? Anybody? One person? I see one hand. Are there others? Man, I feel that. I feel that in my heart today. I seen one hand go up. Is there others? Did, did I miss anybody? Anybody else? What are you doing here? I, I sense something in this service. I did not in the first service. God is speaking to somebody in this place today. Thank you for the one that raised that hand, and I want to address that in just a moment. But I feel like God is still speaking. The Holy Spirit is still saying, what are you doing here? What's going on in your life? What's happening there? Mm. Man, I sense that. Mm, mm, mm can't get away from it. God is speaking to you. That one that raised their hand, always do this. You can, you can stay right where you're at, and, and we're going to pray for you. But if you choose to have some people pray with you, I'd ask you to slip out from where you're at and make your way to this altar. And when you do so, there'll be some people that'll gather around you, and they won't beat you or shake you or <laughs> They'll just pray for you. If you'd like to slip out from where you're at and make your way to this altar, come on. What are you doing here today? What are you doing here? Father, you saw the hand that was raised. You know the hands that were not raised that maybe needed to have been. So I'm asking you to speak to their hearts today to challenge them to follow you in ministry to follow you in direction, to let you know I'm here, Lord. I want to do something for the kingdom. I want to be a part of this great move of God. So, Lord, I ask you to touch their hearts today, to lift them up, to minister to their needs today. Lord, you saw and, and, and heard, and you saw the hearts. Answer that question. Help us to answer that question. What are you doing here today? What are you doing here today? Father, help us. Bring us to that place we need to be. Bring us to that place. Stand with me, with me all over this congregation. Donnie's going to lead us. Sing with him.
just sitting there thinking. There was a saying years ago, but it's still powerful today. It said, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? That's something to think about. The experience of Elijah, one of the things that stands out to me among many others, 